Central. It's now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thanks very much, Speaker. Uh, speaker, before I start, I just want to wish uh, Ramadan Mubarak to all of the Muslim uh, folks in our in our province. It's a, um, a month of uh, religious observation and uh, a great um, great grace for for that community. Uh, sp speaker, my first uh, question is to the um, uh, to the Premier. Um, on Sunday, the Premier, the government, told parents that uh, schools were safe to open, mm -hmm. uh, and then on Monday they turned around and closed the schools. So my question to the Premier is, why would you tell parents on Sunday that schools were safe less than 24 hours before closing them? Yeah. In response, Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Uh, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Leader of the Opposition uh, for the question. Uh, as uh, the uh, Leader of the Opposition would know, that we have uh, consistently uh, been working very hard. The Minister of Education has been working very hard to make sure that our schools are safe, and they have remained remarkably safe uh, through uh, uh, all three uh, uh, waves uh, that we have been fighting COVID, and it's because of the investments that we've made. But obviously, uh, uh, continuing the minister has continued to work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, not only in, in uh, Dr. Williams, but across all 34 public health units uh, in the province. Uh, and as he committed, uh, and has always committed, he said that we would continue to work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, with the public health uh, 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 regions across this province, and take their advice. And the advice uh, had, came, had come that despite the fact that schools are safe, despite the uh, the fact that how important it is to keep our kids in school, recognizing that uh, uh, that we would help, Spons? continue to help and assist to try to keep the numbers down that we're seeing the community spread uh, uh, in the third wave, and that's why the decision was made to act quickly uh, in order to uh, uh, to ensure that more uh, more people were staying home and uh, and that public advice uh, of the chief medical officers of health across the province were listened to. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, the government had been warned for months and months and months on end that schools needed to be made safer, that we needed to see smaller class sizes, that there needed to be investments in better ventilation and ability even for schools' classrooms to open their windows, that we needed mass testing in our schools. And yet the government ignored each and every time those warnings. In fact, they even cut education in their last budget. Speaker, why does this government continue to ignore warnings and the advice of experts leading us right into crisis after crisis? To apply, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the Chief Medical Officer of Health has been absolutely clear, as has every medical officer of health in this province. The plan in place to keep schools safe and open has ensured that students, 1.5 million each and every day, were able to go to school. The issue dealing that we have responded to yesterday as a government singularly exists with rising transmission in the community, creating a threat potentially to our schools, in fact, to every member of this province, which is precisely why, Speaker, we have followed the advice taking decisive, immediate action to prevent a challenge in our schools. In the words of the, of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, he said yesterday, schools have been safe. This intervention is designed to keep them safe, to get them back open, and our collective resolve is to make sure that Ontarians follow the rules that we keep strong protocols in place, reduce the transmission in the community to get Ontario schools back open. The final supplementary. Well, Speaker, you know, this government's lack of action has led to uncertainty, has led to stress, it's led to anxiety. This is anxiety and stress and uncertainty for parents and for kids and for teachers and education workers, because this government didn't want to listen to the experts and refused to spend the money to keep our schools safe. And now the warnings are upon us that, in fact, childcare might be next in terms of closing. Why is it that this government refuses to listen to the expert advice? When will they actually do the right thing, fix this mess, reverse the cuts to education, and invest in our schools, our kids, and our education workers? And the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, we have followed the advice of the medical experts. In the words of the CEO of the Hospital for Sick Children yesterday, and I quote, I don't think we can open schools right now. We just 
We have to just now do our part and not fail our children and do everything we can to drive down community transmission so that schools can be the first doors to open. We certainly agree, which is why we've taken action in this province with the state home order, with a variety of actions designed to reduce transmission in the community. This issue rests exclusively with rising transmission in the province, as well as our ICU capacity uh, really at a breaking point. And that's why this decision was made, pivoting quickly to remote learning, where this government has invested. We've also ensured the continuity of mental health access for these kids, recognizing that they should be in a class. Our commitment on this side of the House is to work every day with the Chief Medical Officer of Health, to do everything we can Spons? to reduce transmission, to protect our health care heroes, and to get kids back in class. Question. Once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Well, Speaker, families and child care workers are very worried that the closure of child care centres in this province is inevitable. The calls for prioritizing the vaccination of child care workers, ECEs, is, they're growing. The calls are growing. Yet here we are again. The government had no plan to keep our child care centres open. They had no plan to vaccinate the frontline child care workers to keep them safe and be able to keep the centres open. When will we hear a plan from this government? Is there a plan that the government can share with us today to keep child care centres open and vaccinate those frontline child care workers? Again, the Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the commitment of this government is to get every frontline worker a vaccine. As supply gets to this province, because we continue to face challenges in getting it to Ontario, that is a matter of fact, if we have more, we would have expanded it to every single frontline worker already. What we have done, however, in the second phase, which we are in, is accelerated prioritization to education staff, our EAs, our ECs, our, our uh, school bus drivers and our teachers that work within our schools, particularly within the hotspot areas of Toronto and Peel as well as for special education staff province-wide. For, for, um, with respect to child care workers, they are also in phase two. And our aim, as more supply gets to this province, is to get them to the head of the line. We know the critical role they play in keeping families and the children they care for safe. That's why we're committed to getting them supply, getting them access to the vaccine they deserve as soon as Ontario gets the vaccine from the federal government. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the Premier. You know, this Premier uh, is behaving with a, with a very dangerous pattern of denial. This week, schools were safe until they weren't. Last week, a stay-at-home order wasn't necessary until it was. Back in February, the government ignored the advice of all of the experts and instead started to open too fast and without investing in extra health precautions and protections. When is this government, Speaker, going to get ahead of the crisis? When are they going to stop saying, when is this Premier going to stop saying things are pretty good and actually ensure that things start getting better for the people of Ontario? The government has yeah, well, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't know where the Leader of the Opposition has been for the last year, but Ontario has been leading the way when it comes to fighting the coronavirus, Mr. Speaker. What last yesterday and what last week represented was the Ontario government and the people of Ontario finally moving away from defence and to offence to fight and defeat the COVID va virus once and for all. We started fighting back by increasing our testing capacity from 5,000 to 75,000. We inherited 5, 000, the ability to do 5,000 tests a day. It's at 75,000. We started fighting back by increasing hospital and, and ICU beds in the system. We fight it back by increasing 3,000 beds. We fight it back by increasing critical care capacity in the province. We fought back by increasing long-term care. We fought back by adding beds in long-term care, Mr. Speaker. And we're fighting back by bringing the vaccines into the communities that are the hardest hit, and we're fighting back by bringing it into the Spons? workplaces that are so essential to keeping this province going, Mr. Speaker. We are fighting back. That's what the next 28 days is all about, and the Leader of the Opposition should help us to do it. The final supplementary. 
Speaker, once again, this government refused to act until it was too late. They refused to spend the money on making schools safe, and now the schools are closed. They refused to spend the money to vaccinate essential frontline workers, and guess what? The, vaccine, or the spread of COVID-19 uh, occurred in our province. They refused to make smaller class sizes uh, in our schools. They refused to vaccinate frontline education workers. And now, of course, our schools are closed. My question is, when will this government undertake the measures necessary to deal with the crisis that we're in? When will they give us paid sick days? When will they give us and workers paid time off to get their vaccines? When will they make sure those essential frontline workers are getting vaccinated? When will this government get ahead uh -huh. of the crisis that we're all dealing with? Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition will know, will know full well that this government inherited a mess from the previous Liberal government and left us in the, with the inability to fight the pandemic Order. from day one. That is why Order. we had to be on the defence for so long, Mr. Speaker. Order. That is why we made important investments in health care. That is why we made important investments in long-term care. That is why the Minister of Finance has made important investments to keep our small, medium and large job creators going. That is why the Premier fought so hard to ensure that there were 20 paid sick days for the people of the province of Ontario. That is why the Minister Order. of Education ensured that there was over a billion and a half dollars for our students so that our schools could return safely, Mr. Speaker. That is what we have been doing since day one of this pandemic, and we are fighting back, Mr. Speaker. We are fighting back despite the fact that month after month the federal government has disappointed us with vaccine Response. supply. We are fighting back and taking the vaccines that we got into the communities that are most impacted, into those essential businesses, and we're getting the job done. There's more work to do, and we will get it done despite the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. The next question, Member for Hamilton Mountain. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Last week, the government announced the list of hotspots, but that list left out some of the hardest hit areas in Hamilton. Hamilton's chief medical officer asked that additional postal codes be asked be added. She was denied, so she added them herself. Our public health units are trying to implement this government's announcement, but they need support. Right now, Hamilton is behind some of the neighboring regions when it comes to vaccinating eligible groups. Will this government provide Hamilton Public Health whatever support that it actually needs to get this job done? The parliamentary assistant, member for Eglinton Lawrence, to respond. Thank you, Speaker. Our government has been clear. Phase two of our vaccine rollout will be focused on older adults, those at risk of serious illness, and our hotspot areas. And this approach is designed to save lives, protect those at risk of serious illness, and to stop the virus from spreading. And let me be clear: hotspots have been identified based on historic and ongoing rates of COVID-19 deaths, hospitalizations and transmissions, and on outbreak data, research and analysis conducted by the COVID-19 Science Advisory Table, low testing rates, sociodemographic barriers that may result in vaccine hesitancy. All of these things go into picking the hotspot areas, and we have a number of them picked out, and we have been going at those communities to try to make the vaccinations more widespread in those communities, including in communities um, uh, that are represented by the MPP for Hamilton Mountain and the MPP for for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas have Response. been identified as hotspot areas, and as soon as we have more vaccines, we will be in more communities getting those vaccines out. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Premier. When the government announced the list of hotspots, it also shared confusing information about who is eligible. I am constantly hearing from residents in my community who don't know if they're eligible and they don't know how to get an appointment. This government has to stop making policy by press conference and actually provide public health units the support they need. Hamilton is still working on identifying people with high-risk medical conditions. These residents are still waiting to get an appointment. Will the government provide Hamilton Public Health more support in getting this done instead of making their work harder and making confusing announcements? Number five, Lincoln Lawrence. 
Thank you, Speaker. Our government has been clear. Phase two of our vaccine rollout will be focused, as I said, on older adults, those with serious illness, and those in the hotspot areas. We also know that certain communities have been disproportionately impacted by COVID-19, and we understand that administering vaccines to people who live in these areas is critical to reducing the impact of COVID-19 as quickly as possible, which is why, as part of our second phase of our vaccine rollout, we have identified specific hotspot areas in postal codes in 13 public health units around the province. Right now, anyone in Hamilton over the age of 50 in those hotspot areas can register and get a, a vaccine in those hotspot areas. And uh, Across the province, uh, at pharmacies, everyone over the age of 55 can get a, a vaccine. So There's lots of uh, vaccines available. Response. We want people to get out there and get the vaccines as quickly as possible. We're doing everything we can to make that happen in Hamilton and across the province. Thank you. The next question, the member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. Thank you and good morning, Mr. Speaker. Last week, our government issued an emergency stay-at-home order to continue to keep Ontarians safe. And that means more people will be forced to work from home, learn from a distance, and connect with loved ones virtually. To do this, they need access to the internet. But residents in Flamborough, Glanbrook, my riding, need better broadband. I'd like to share part of an email from a constituent in Linden. She writes, I am married with four children. I, along with most in my area, am struggling with getting adequate internet access at my home. With heightened need for decent home internet because of online school and working from home due to COVID, my frustration is growing. This isn't the first time that I've received an email like this, and I look forward to the day when I received the last of these messages. Mr. Speaker, when can I tell Question. my constituents who are in dire need of internet that better connectivity is coming their way? To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and the member is absolutely right, and I thank her for the question. There is no time more important than right now to get more households connected to high-speed internet. That's why we're taking a groundbreaking approach to build broadband faster so that everyone in Ontario can get reliable internet no matter where they live. It's undeniable that the lack of broadband internet is detrimental to the daily lives and livelihoods of too many Ontarians. Can you imagine that as many as 1.4 million people in Ontario live without broadband in this day and age? On this side of the house, that is 1.4 million people too many. That's why I introduced the Supporting Broadband and Infrastructure Expansion Act in 2021. This legislation addresses the onerous barriers faced by the telecommunications sector when it comes to building broadband faster. And I'm thrilled to Fox. say that finally this cornerstone legislation has been passed by the members of this House. Now the telecommunications sector can get those shovels moving and those households connected. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. A 2019 report by the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce on digital infrastructure notes that significant investments are needed to bring the current infrastructure up to speed. The President and CEO Keenan Loomis said, in this digital age, the ongoing improvement to Hamilton's digital infrastructure is essential to the economic prosperity of our city. Businesses in Hamilton rely on high-speed, dependable, low-cost internet connectivity to operate and remain competitive. Although this report was written two years ago, the need for more internet connectivity still prevails and has been made much worse by the COVID-19 pandemic. And that's why I was pleased to learn that Ontario's 2021 budget commits an historic new investment of $2.8 billion in broadband infrastructure to ensure that every region has broadband services by 2025. Question. Would the minister please share with this House what we can expect from this investment? Again, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much uh, to the member again for her question. Mr. Speaker, our government's primary focus is to protect every life and every job we possibly can from COVID-19. Without healthy people, we can't have a healthy economy. And that's why we introduced Ontario's Action Plan, protecting people's health and our economy. This is the next phase of Ontario's response to COVID-19. Part of the investments in the budget go directly to getting more Ontarians connected to the digital economy, ensuring that no one gets left behind. As the member noted, 
I'm proud this government is committing an additional $2.8 billion for a near total of $4 billion to accelerate, accelerate broadband expansion across all regions of this province. Our historic investment will benefit regional economies, farmers who can connect and use technologies for their industry, entrepreneurs Response. and small businesses, and the list goes on, Mr. Speaker. We're stepping up to the plate to fill the digital infrastructure gap, gap left behind by members across the aisle. The next question, the member for Essex. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday we learned that uh, lobbyist and longtime PC Party insider Corey Tanecki apparently used his regularly scheduled caucus presentation time to warn Conservative MPs about leaking decisions to journalists before the Premier's press conferences. Speaker, Mr. Tanecki's firm is registered lo to lobby in Ontario on behalf of companies like Amazon, so his presence at caucus uh, raises serious concerns about how the Premier makes his decision. So, Speaker, my question through you to the Premier is why, when ICUs are overflowing, when schools are being cancelled, when our small business community is collapsing, and when COVID cases are burning out of control, why are you bringing in lobbyists to warn your MPPs about anything other than how badly you're handling this crisis? The member will know full well that the reason why we're having such a challenge, and we, were having, and we had such a challenge in the first and second wave, uh, Mr. Speaker, was because of the lack of investment that was made by the previous Liberal government across many different sectors, whether it was the health care sector, whether it was the college, uh, colleges and universities, Mr. Speaker, whether it was the uh, uh, small businesses which were Order. fleeing the province of Ontario in droves, Mr. Speaker. We lost over 300,000 manufacturing jobs, and in 2018, the people elected a government that would focus on their priorities. Their priorities were job creation, health care, education, Order. and in all of those areas, Mr. Speaker, Speaker, before the pandemic, we saw thousands of jobs Order. returning to the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We're making historic investments in health care, Mr. Speaker, because we need to increase our ICU capacity that was left to us by the Liberals as one of the Response. lowest per capita in North America, Mr. Speaker. We want to end Hellway health care, and we are going to do that. It is the NDP who, as, as the member for Brampton South had said once, the only time the NDP are happy is when people are sad. We're going to make sure that people are happy. Thank you. Thank you. Order. The supplementary question. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. Uh, the, uh, the government of House Leader's response, or spin rather, uh, reminds me of our late great friend Paul Duger. That answer was definitely face palm worthy. Uh, you gave us nothing uh, tangible in that answer. Speaker, the Premier told himself and everyone else yesterday that he never makes a decision himself. I guess that's what makes sense now that we know that lobbyists and PC party insiders are the ones who are really calling the shots around the caucus table. So again, my question to the Premier Speaker, for the next meeting, can the Premier tell us whether he can convince Corey Tanecki or any other PC party insider turned lobbyist to put paid sick days or more support for hotspots on the agenda? We're just asking for an entire province here. Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, ironic coming from a member of parliament who has accomplished the sum total of nothing in the time that he has been here, Mr. Speaker. It took this government, this Minister of Health, this Premier to finally get a hospital for the people of Windsor, Essex, Mr. Speaker, something that they had fought for for so long, Mr. Speaker. It was not a priority when the NDP shared government with the Liberals in the minority in the minority area, Mr. Speaker. It was never a priority. Long-term care was Order. never a priority of that member and of the NDP when they shared government with the, with the Liberals, Mr. Speaker. It was auto insurance, and they settled for what? A stretch goal, Mr. Speaker. This is a party, the NDP, that has never been trusted to govern the province of Ontario but one time. And they were so bad at it that the then Premier abandoned their party to join the Liberal Spons. Party, Mr. Speaker, and they have Order. never, ever come close to gaining the confidence of the people of the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We haven't really got the job done. Thank you. Order. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Today, there are 623 patients in Ontario's ICUs. And today's COVID positivity rate in Ontario is a dangerously high 10.3%, guaranteeing that ICU admissions are going to continue to rise. 
ICU doctors and nurses and staff have been working flat out for a year. They're exhausted, they're tired, they're burnt out. And yesterday, the minister said, we're going to add another 350 ICU beds. Those beds will require staff, staff that we do not have. As critical care doctor Michael Warner says, eventually we'll run out of space to move patients because we don't have the staff to care for them. So once again, it feels like we're not ready and that there's no clear plan. So, Speaker, through you, can the Premier assure Ontarians Order. that we'll have enough trained staff to support Question. the additional ICU beds that are going to be required for the rest of this pandemic? To reply, the government house leader. How can this member, representing a party that governed this province for 15 years, a member who was the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health, get up and criticize this government, which has had to do everything in its power to catch up because of, the, of what we were left. Mr. Speaker. We inherited a system that had one of the lowest ICU capacities per capita in North America. We inherited a system that did not have a staffing protocol. Mr. Speaker. We inherited a system that allowed us to do 5,000 tests a day. And What have we done? We've invested in ICU capacity. We're increasing it. We've added 3,000 beds to the system. We've added critical care capacity to the system. We've took our testing from five uh, 5,000 to 75,000, Mr. Speaker. We're doing that for the people of the province of Ontario because even before we were elected, we knew the devastation that liberal cuts to health care were causing the people of the province of Ontario. It's not just about new hospitals in Windsor to come, so it's not just about new hospitals in Brampton, Mr. Speaker. It's about making investments to make the system better for the long term. Supplementary question. Speaker, I think we need to take it down a notch or two today about what's happening with Ontario. And I want to talk about something a little closer to home. You know, we know the danger of the variants in the third wave, but every day in this place, we ask 300 people to come into this building on public transit, walking, and it poses a risk for them. Now, we've asked the opposition, all three leaders, have asked for a virtual question period. We do virtually committee, municipalities, the federal government, Legislatures across the province are doing that. I implore the government to make some plans for that. But more importantly, there is no threshold by which we decide when we pull the trigger on putting, closing this place down. So we don't pose risk to all these people who are here, people who have helped us every day as members, people who come here every day to protect us, to inform us. It's not right. Question. So, Speaker, through you, will the government House Leader commit to meeting with us to make some plans for about when we pull the trigger and how we manage that after? Thank you. Order. Order. The government House Leader. First and foremost, Mr. Speaker, I'll say this. There is no other provincial legislature that has gone virtual, Mr. Speaker. The member opposite will know that because the previous Liberal government made absolutely no investments in the running of the Legislative Assembly, it is the investments that we have had to make that will allow our committee rooms to be, uh, uh, to be, to be made public uh, through video conferencing, Mr. Speaker. Uh, at the same time, Mr. Speaker, I will remind the Honourable General that this House passed a motion, one of the first things it passed when we returned, it passed a motion that took away the, 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 the right of me to adjourn the House and put it in the hands of all of the House leaders. So the protocol is this, Mr. Speaker, which he agreed to, which was unanimously agreed to in, in, in this House, Mr. Speaker, that when uh, if it should be required, all House leaders will approach the, the Speaker and we will pass a motion to adjourn the House, Mr. Speaker. But I will say this, as long as essential frontline workers are going to work, as long as you can get a coffee at Tim Hortons, as long as ECE people are working, Mr. Speaker, I think the people of the Response. province of Ontario expect their members of provincial parliament who are making incredibly important decisions for, of them to be here working and we will continue to do that in a safe way, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Order. Your entitlement, order. Entitlement, John. Order. Your entitlement, Stop the clock. John. Minister of Labour, come to order. Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development, come to order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. Yeah, forget about that poor Tim Hortons worker. Right? The Minister of Labour is warned. Member for Ottawa South is warned. Start the clock. The next question, the member for Brantford, Sarnia Lambton. Thank you, uh, Speaker. 
Uh, my speaker, my speaker, my question is to uh, minister, the Minister of uh, Children and Youth. Uh, Mr. Speaker, for years, the family of children and youth with special needs have struggled to access the clinical assessment and services their children need. These are not new problems. Many of us on this side of the House watched for over a decade as demand grew and the previous Liberal government continued to underfund the system. Families have been Order. challenged even further by COVID-19, which has made accessing appropriate supports and services especially difficult for those caring for children with special needs. Mr. Speaker, would the minister tell this House what the government is doing to address the challenges that families of children with special needs are facing? Thank you. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thanks very much to the member from Sarnia-Lambton for a great question this morning. Speaker, supporting children with special needs and their families is a top priority for our government, not just during COVID-19, but beyond, Speaker. We announced a number of new initiatives that are going to improve the lives and outcomes of children and youth with special needs in Ontario through Budget 2021, which was introduced by our great Finance Minister, Minister Bethlen Falvey, just a few short weeks ago. These uh, include significant investments in buildings, Mr. Speaker, like brand new children's treatment centres in Chatham-Kent and also the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario at Chio in Ottawa, a renewed investment as well to the Abilities Centre in Whitby, Hamilton Mr. Mountain Speaker, Mountain but we didn't stop there. We announced a groundbreaking investment of $240 million over four years to ensure that children and families have access to early intervention and children's special needs, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to talking about more. Supplementary question, member for Sarnia-Lampton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and through you and to you to the minister, I'm very glad to hear about the fact, the focus our government has placed on ensuring that children and families have access to early intervention and children's special needs services. Speaker, the science shows that children's special needs services are most effective and result in better outcomes for children and families when they include early intervention, proactive life planning, and support for families. Would the minister please provide this House with more details on how this new investment and whether will address these critical areas? Thank you. Member for York Centre, come to order. Minister of Children, Community and Social Services to reply. Thanks. And thanks again to the member from Sarnia Lambton. Speaker, that member is absolutely correct, as he usually is. Early intervention is a critical piece in delivering children's special needs services. Our new investment will focus on areas key to improving long-term outcomes for both children with special needs and their families, providing early and timely connection to supports proactive Member and Hamilton holistic Mountain life Mountain planning Mountain. speaker and supports for natural transitions such as into school and also into adulthood. Focusing on these areas will help families access services earlier, improving the quality of available services and get better results for families in areas like community inclusion, as well as participation and success in education and employment. Speaker, improving the quality and accessibility of supports Response. for children with special needs is a top priority for our government and will continue making progress on improving the system to get better outcomes for those kids, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Sudbury. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, Speaker, the NDP had cautioned the Premier, the question is for the Premier, Speaker. Uh, the NDP had cautioned the Premier and the Minister of Colleges and Universities about massive cuts to Laurentian for months. And instead of taking action to protect Northern Ontario, the Conservative Party chose to stand on the sidelines and do nothing. Yesterday, over 100 faculty members received termination notices at Laurentian University. The university is also cutting nearly 70 programs, including whole departments, many of which are unique Indigenous and Francophone programs, which Laurentian is mandated to support. Speaker, they're cutting programs like engineering, math, economics, entrepreneurship, nursing, and midwifery. Laurentian University is Sudbury's third largest speaker. My question is, how is the Premier going to address the many people who are losing their jobs amidst the pandemic because the government refused to fund and protect this public university? The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, and Parliamentary Assistant. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Indeed, it is uh, deeply disturbing uh, the, the situation Laurentian University has found itself in, a, a situation where such drastic and immediate action is needed uh, to ensure long-term sustainability. Obviously, Mr. Speaker, the priority of this government continues to be uh, the students and the families affected uh, by this, Mr. Speaker. It's why, as a government, Mr. Speaker, um, in addition to obviously looking into this specific issue at Laurentian University, as a government, we continue to expand funding for francophone supports. We extend, expand funding for Indigenous supports as an institution. This deeply uh, concerning situation, Mr. Speaker, is before the courts, uh, so it would be inappropriate to comment further. Thank you. The member for Nickel Belt, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Right now, in my community, instead of being focused on their final project and studying for their year-end exam, Laurentian students are worried about their future. The Minister of College and University keep promising that the Conservative government would protect Laurentian students and ensure that their studies were not disrupted. However, thousands of students woke up Monday morning to learn that their program, their entire department had been cut, that their teacher, their supervisor, their mentors had been laid off. La Laurentienne est désignée sous la loi sur les services en français. The Laurentian University is designated at, under the law for francophone services. Will the government respect this act or will the francophone community will have to drag them to court so that they can respect their own act? Mr. Speaker, this government remains resolute in ensuring pathways to graduation for all students. That is exactly what we will do. Mr. Speaker, with respect to francophone programming that the member opposite spoke about, let's talk about that. $17.6 million to expand French language supports for the post-secondary sector. $74 million to support over 30,000 students who enroll in French language and programming across Ontario. Moving forward with Ontario's first ever francophone university governed by and for francophones. Ten other post-secondary institutions that provide hundreds of French language programming across the province of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it's those members that voted against expanded supports for our Indigenous institutes, that voted against increased funding for those institutes, and that have voted against supports for historic reductions in tuition that are benef benefiting Francophone students, Indigenous students, and all Ontarians across this province, Mr. Speaker. That's their record, which they'll have to defend to students in their writings. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Van Nuys. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Health. Last week, I wrote to the Minister to ask for improved vaccine accessibility in my riding of Ottawa Vanier that has been particularly hard hit by the pandemic. Over the last five months, the neighbourhoods of Vanier and Overbrook in my riding have had the third highest total of individuals with COVID-19 in Ottawa. Since then, we've learned that a number of the hotspot communities identified by the government to receive priority vaccines are less hard hit by COVID-19 than the average neighborhood. These are frustrating news for residents in high-risk areas, and we need transparency on how the government has made these decisions. Can the minister explain what data was used to identify which communities would be prioritized to receive the vaccine? To reply on behalf of the government, the member for Eglinton Lawrence and parliamentary assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. As I said earlier, our government has been clear. Phase two of our vaccine rollout is focused on older adults, those at risk of serious illness, and our hotspot areas. And the approach is designed to save lives, protect those at risk of serious illness, and to stop the virus from spreading. Let me be clear. Hotspots have been identified based on historic and ongoing high rates of COVID-19 deaths, hospitalizations and transmission, and I'd like to point out to the member opposite that these communities were identified based not only on the high rates of COVID-19, but also on outbreak data, research and analysis conducted by the Ontario COVID-19 Science Advisory Table, low testing rates and socio-demographic barriers that may result in vaccine hesitancy. Of course, as we get more vaccines, we're going to be able to open up to more areas. We want to get vaccines out to every community Response. as quickly as possible and in the arms of every Ontarian as soon as possible. We're working hard to make that happen. Supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And again, my question is for the Minister of Health. It's clear that the government's choices of hotspot communities were not informed by all the necessary data. For example, in Ottawa, our local unit had not identified any high priority neighbourhoods in one of the hotspot regions this government chose and was, in fact, doing pretty well compared to others. So, my question is will the minister commit? to working with local public health units to identify high-risk communities and designate hotspots to improve access to vaccines in vulnerable neighbourhoods to control the spread of COVID-19. The Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our entire strategy works with pub local public health units. We've worked with local public health units from the beginning. We know that they know the situation on the ground in their communities, and that's why we're working together. Although some people have suggested that's not the right way to approach things, we believe it is because local public health units have on the ground knowledge. Uh, as of April 11th, almost 98 per cent of those 80 or older have received a vaccine, and over 22 per cent have received their second dose in the Ottawa area. And it should be noted that last year, Ottawa was one of the first public health units to receive a shipment of the Pfizer vaccine in the province. We're working very hard on all vaccines across the province, and I want to point out that right now, 87 per cent of Ontarians, 80 and over, have been vaccinated. 80 per cent of Ontarians, 75 to 79, have been vaccinated. And 60 per cent of Ontarians, 70 to 74, have been vaccinated. We're working very hard to get the vaccines Response. out to people, especially in priority areas. Areas, we're only constrained by our supply. Thank you. Thank you. Next question, the member for Flamborough Glamborough. Thank you, Speaker. And we all know that this past year has been very difficult on all Ontarians, including staff and students at our post-secondary institutions. Speaker, I'm proud that our government has always, always put students at the center of our education policy, and that has not changed during the pandemic. In particular, I was pleased that our government was making post-secondary education more accessible for Indigenous learners. Can the minister please provide an update to this House on what the government is doing to support access to education for Indigenous learners? The member for Northumberland, Peterborough South, Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank the member for flamborough glanbrook for that a really important question. She's absolutely right, Mr. Speaker. It's vital that we continue to work closely with our Indigenous institutes to support them as institutions and to support the learners that walk their hallways. Mr. Speaker, the government's increased access to education by expanding OSAP eligibility for programs at Indigenous institutes starting in 2020-2021. The financial assistance will help ensure Indigenous learners have access to a culturally responsive and high-quality post-secondary education experience. We will prepare them to meet the labour market needs for tomorrow. Mr. Speaker, this is an important step, as previously students didn't have that access. Mr. Speaker, we're going to continue to find ways to support our Indigenous students across the Response. province of Ontario and work closely with our Indigenous institutes to explore increasing labour market opportunities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Order. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I'm very proud that our government is taking concrete steps to support Ontario's Indigenous population by supporting access to culturally responsive and high-quality post-secondary education offered by Indigenous institutes and independent of other Ontario colleges and universities. Would the minister elaborate on why this important work by our government is so necessary in supporting Ontario's Indigenous learners? Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I want to thank the member for that important question again. As speaker, uh, we know that we must expand post-secondary education opportunities for Indigenous learners. Mr. Speaker, we know that approximately 53 per cent of Indigenous peoples aged 15, or age 25 to 64, hold a post-secondary credential, compared to 65 per cent of the non-Indigenous population, according to the 2016 cens census. Mr. Speaker, thanks to the remarkable work of our Indigenous institutes, thanks to the remarkable work of elders, of others who've informed the curriculum there, enrollment in our Indigenous institutes has increased by nearly 40 per cent since 2018, something I desperately hope the members of the opposition would support and not heckle as well. Mr. Speaker, 
Our government believed it was necessary to take important steps to support our Indigenous institutes by expanding OSAP eligibility, Mr. Speaker. In addition, we've expanded capital funding, Order. funding for our Indigenous institutes, Mr. Response. Speaker. As Minister Romano noted, there is widespread agreement by Indigenous leaders, communities and education professionals that investing in culturally responsive learning in post-secondary education opportunities for Indigenous learners will have tremendous benefits. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Meshkigawak, James Bay. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There are 4,000 mining claims in the territories of Grassy Narrows First Nation, north of Kenora. Meanwhile, two sites of potential mercury contaminations poisoning the rivers, the, the wildlife and the people of Grassy Narrows has yet to be acted on by this Conservative government. Will the Premier please tell the people of Grassy Narrows in Ontario, does he think that being open for business should come at the expense of the health of the people of Grassy Narrow. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, obviously, uh, mercury contamination in the English and uh, uh, Wabagon rivers has uh, had a profound impact on the communities uh, and must be properly addressed. The member will know that uh, Indigenous communities are assessing the extent of and location of mercury contamination using funding approved by the English and Wabagon Rivers uh, Remediation Panel from the $85 million trust. Uh, the ministry is holding uh, Domtar responsible for assessing the extent of the mercury contamination in and around the mill site, including addressing the infrastructure and stormwater management issues. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The supplementary question. Speaker, back to the Premier. Another star investigation, with the support of the community, has again undertaken to do what this and the previous government never bothered to do. And that is clear out of the contaminate, contaminated soil that was found behind the Dryden mill in the exact spot where a former mill worker reported dumping barrels of mercury. Instead, this government has been quick to consider mining claims while the fish are still unsafe to eat. The people of Grassinaros are hesitant to drink the water. Will the Premier commit today to honour the land declaration that Grassinaros enacted in 2018 to ban industrial or mining activities on their territories? And as Chief Randy Fobister told me, let my Question. people live in peace. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, of course, we will continue to work with our First Nations partners, uh, uh, not only in this, but in, across uh, uh, whether it's housing, whether it's uh, education, whether it's health care on, on our First Nations, uh, with our First Nations partners, Mr. Speaker. Look, uh, we are going to continue to work closely with them because we understand how important it is that uh, to develop in the north, but we understand how important it is to do it safely. That is why the Minister of uh, uh, Energy, Northern Development and, and Mines has been working so closely with our partners in the area. Area. It is a source of jobs and opportunity for our First Nations partners in that area, but the member is quite correct. It has to be done safely. It has to be done in cooperation with our partners in the area. He is also very correct that the previous Liberal government failed uh, the North, failed our First Nations communities. We're going to continue to, to advance uh, uh, policies in the North that uh, benefit not only our First Nations partners, but benefit all of the people of the province Response. of Ontario. And we're going to do it in a way, in a manner that respects uh, the rights of our First Nations partners. Thank you. The next question, the member for York Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Health. Speaker, the Minister locked down our province and is now risking the lives of thousands of Ontarians by cancelling surgeries to preserve intensive care units from being overwhelmed. So Ontarians deserve to know. They deserve some clarity about the number of available and occupied ICU beds. And I'm only talking about ICU beds now. I'm not looking for an answer on acute care beds or the 3,100 acute care beds they built last year. But the real ICU numbers right now. Critical Care Services says Ontario has 2,412 ICU beds. 2412. On the weekend, CCSO showed 1,851 patients in Ontario's ICUs. That puts provincial ICU occupancy at 76%. My question to the minister, am I correct? Just over 2,400 beds, 1,851 patients on the weekend equals 76% provincial ICU capacity. And if I'm incorrect, which one of those numbers I cited question. is wrong, and what is the real number? 
And if I am correct, then please confirm that Ontario's ICU occupancy before she cancelled surgeries was under 80 per cent. The parliamentary assistant and member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. You know, from the start of the pandemic, our government's top priority has been to protect the health and well-being of all Ontarians. And in response to escalating case counts, uh, which have led to increased hospitalizations and ICU occupancy rates, which are already over the peak of the wave uh, two, um, our government has implemented a stay-at-home and declared a state of emergency. The stay-at-home order and other new and existing public health and workplace safety measures will preserve our public health system capacity safeguard our vulnerable, vulnerable populations, and allow for more progress to be made with vaccinations to save lives. I'd like to remind the member opposite that to ensure that everyone who requires a care in a hospital receives the high-quality care that they know and expect. We've invested $1.8 billion in the hospital sector for 2021-22, bringing the total additional investments in hospitals since the start of the pandemic to over $5 billion. And recently, on January 18, we Response. provided $125 million to expand critical care beds, adding over 500 critical care beds, and I'll have more in the supplemental. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. The answer or the non-answer speaks for itself. If the minister locks us down at home, imposes a stay-at-home order, and closes schools and cancels surgeries because ICUs may be overwhelmed, the parliamentary assistant should come to the House prepared to give us an answer. Ontario's ICU occupancy is under 80 percent before the cancellation of surgeries. Yes or no? Maybe the member for Eglinton Lawrence can answer that in the supplementary. To my second question, we're locking down everything and cancelling surgeries because ICU may be overwhelmed, according to this government. If so, whose fault is it? Space is not a concern. According to Dr. Benoit, many of Ontario's ICU-trained physicians don't have full-time jobs. According to Dr. Strauss, most ICU doctors in Ontario are underemployed. The shortage appears to be in nurses. Right before the second wave, the province laid off some nurses, including in the minister's own writing in September. They issued pink slips to nurses in Newmarket, Speaker. Speaker, it takes four months to train an ICU nurse. Sorry, it takes four months to train a nurse to become an ICU nurse. So my question is, and I'd like a clear answer, please. Question. How many net new nurses? Nurses, how many net new ICU nurses did Ontario train in the last 12 months? And thank you to the member opposite for the question. Um, our hospitals and healthcare organizations are working together to make sure that we have the necessary health human resources required to respond to any potential surge event in COVID-19 patients. And we're also allowing for the redeployment of healthcare workers to sites experiencing significant capacity pressures. These efforts, with the ramping down of elective surgeries and other non-urgent or emergent clinical activity, will add an additional 700 to 1,000 beds, with 350 coming online this week and ensure that our health system has the tools and resources needed to provide world-class care to every Ontarian who requires hospitalization. And that is our commitment to the people of Ontario. That's what we're working on. We're working with uh, all of our health care resources to provide a team-based approach uh, to providing those services and the health human Response. resources we need in the ICU uh, units across the province. And we're going to make sure that people have the care that they need when they appear in hospital. I think everyone understands that's the priority. The member for York Centre will come to order. The next question, the member for York Southwest. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have stood in this house. My question is to the Premier. I stood in this house many times speaking about how my community of York Southwestern has been neglected and left behind in this government's um, COVID response. It took until September 28 of last year to get a COVID testing facility in York Southwestern. Our community is once again anxiously awaiting a permanent facility, a vaccine facility in my riding. My office has been involved helping Humber River Hospital with pop-up clinics at senior buildings. Now uh, I hear reports from families that the government pop-up rollouts in our community is being met with chaos and confusion about when, where, and how to get registered or book an appointment. When is the government going Question. to get it is act together and realize Ontario is not doing great and everything isn't fine? People's lives are at stake. Again, Member Fragan from Lawrence, Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you, 
Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government has been clear our vaccine rollout is focused now on phase two, older adults and those at risk of serious illness in, and those in hotspot areas, uh, like the member opposite's community. We also know that COVID-19 has disproportionate impacts on certain neighbourhoods like your community across the province, and we understand that administering vaccine to people who live in these areas is critical to reducing the impact of COVID-19 as quickly as possible. I was at the opening of the Downsview Arena uh, Vaccine Centre with Humber River. I understand Humber River is working with the Black, uh, Black Creek uh, Community Health Centre to set up an uh, immunization clinic going in, and I read about uh, immunizations happening in your community in the newspapers recently. We're doing everything we can to ensure that, that vaccines are being delivered and administered in your Response. community and to make sure that people get the vaccines as quickly as possible. The supplementary question. Thank you. My question is again to the Premier. Folks in my community over the ages 18 and above cannot book an appointment in our own community. I quote the Premier, Ontario is not doing great. Now everything is not fine. In fact, this government is always a day late and dollar short in its COVID response. Hotspots and high-risk communities like York Southwestern are treated like an afterthought instead of an urgent priority. Why this inequities and why are our residents, those essential workers and seniors, not getting equal access to vaccines from the government? When will you fix them, your pop-up organizational mess, and when will York Southwestern receive a permanent vaccine facility? Thank you to the member opposite. Thank you, Speaker, um, uh, for the question. Uh, it's really everybody is getting vaccines uh, as quickly as we're able to deliver them. The number one issue is how many vaccines are available. And we're still having some issue with supply coming in from the federal government. As soon as we have more supply, we get those vaccines out to people. Your community is a hotspot area. It's been identified as such. Many resources are going into that community, including the Downsview Arena, which was opened up recently with Humber River Hospital, as I mentioned before. And uh, there'll be pop-up community clinics available as public health units have uh, the, the resources and the vaccines to go into those communities, they're moving around, and the vaccine uh, availability in those communities will be advertised locally to the people in those communities when the clinics are going to be there. That they've, I've uh, read also today that they have been knocking on doors in some communities Response. and bringing people down, and that's what's going to happen. We're getting out there as quickly as we, as we can to all of those communities when we have the vaccine supply. Thank you. Next question, the member for Glengarry Prescott Russell. Merci, Monsieur le Président. La... Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Just Minister the of Education. To parents across Ontario, telling them that all publicly funded schools would remain open after the April break, repeating that schools were safe. Then one day later, the Premier closed them for weeks. Mr. Speaker, the constant contradictory messaging from the Minister and the Premier is putting our children and education workers at risk. It's time to end the chaos one and for, once and for all by making schools safe. When will the Minister adopt the expert recommendations like capping class sizes at 15, investing in urgent repairs to ventilation in classrooms, and vaccinating all education workers over the April break so that schools can be safe and stay open for good after this closure? Of education. Mr. Speaker, under our plan, Ontario has one of the lowest case rates in the nation for children under 20. That is because we put the investments in place, we followed the medical advice, and we've led in that respect. The only reason why schools are closed today, and the member knows this, is because community transmission has spiked. The seven-day average is well over 3,000. We had 4,000 cases for four consecutive days, and the chief medical officer felt came forward, brought forth a uh, recommendation for this closure, recognizing we're pivoting to online learning. There's the continuity of learning for these kids, which is important. And of course, they continue to get access to mental health supports. We recognize the necessity of children being in school, but we also recognize, as I think all members of this house, and I would argue all parents recognize, that we were not gonna compromise the safety of a child, putting them into a school when transmission is so high that it can, at that point, create risk for families, further compounding the spread of COVID-19. So we made a difficult Response. decision and a decisive one, quickly pivoting as required in a pandemic to protect the lives of families. We will continue to do that, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary question. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Monsieur le Président, le ministre parle d'enseignement en ligne. 
the, the minister is talking about the online. As if it were an option uh, everywhere in this province, but it isn't. Uh, la réalité est tout autre. Monsieur le Président, dans plusieurs de nos régions rurales, the reality is different. It's not possible in many rural uh, regions. We need security and safety in classes. We have to invest in better ventilation in classes. We have to vaccinate all the teachers today. Why the government refused to use the April, the April break to vaccinate everybody? Why do they continue to ignore the expert? Minister of Education. Mr. Speaker, the government is committed to getting every frontline worker within our schools and childcare settings a vaccine. How the member opposite could, could help us constructively is to call her federal Liberal members and urge them to get this province the vaccine we need to defeat this pandemic. If, if the Liberal Party wants to be constructive, they will work with us and urge the feds to get the province and our communities, particularly those in high-risk communities, the vaccine we need to defeat this pandemic. It's the only way forward. And for our, for our schools, for example, a case study is based on the limited supply of this province. We've had to focus in on starting with vaccinations for special education students province-wide and for education staff within the high-risk neighbourhoods in Toronto and Peel. And then we intend to expand it to Durham, to York, to Hamilton, Halton and Ottawa, and then, of course, province-wide. If we had more vaccine, quite obviously, we would have opened it up to every Ontarian. But we have to make choices. Yes. And so in the interest Response. of saving lives, We've started there. Our intention is to scale up so that every worker, every educator, every Ontarian gets the vaccine they deserve. Here is the next question. Member for Toronto Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Shane is a retail worker in my riding with an underlying health condition. Shane contacted my office last week, uh, frustrated that he still had no idea when he'd be getting his vaccine. Shane lives in the M4Y postal code, uh, which was not included on the province's list of COVID hotspots. M4Y, though, is also the same postal code for the church in Wellesley Village, a community with higher infection rates than the postal codes that were prioritized in PC-held ridings. And I'm, I'm particularly struck by the cruelty of this government speaker that is politically gerrymandering vaccines, but worse, but worse, doing so without taking into account order. the historical inequities of queer and trans communities that were abandoned by every level of government during the last pandemic this community went through during the AIDS crisis. Speaker, our local hospital and public health unit recognized the historical harms that were done and the high risk Question. of this community and have been working to fix the province's mess. M4Y residents are now eligible for vaccines at pop-up sites, but residents are still confused and exasperated by this government's slow and sloppy roll rollout. Why did the Premier announce uh, that he would prioritize postal codes with no plan to actually follow up uh, on his commitments? To respond, Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Pardon. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Any insinuation that there has been any political uh, input into any of these decisions about hotspots is shameful. Let me just read out, because I've said many times how we prioritize based on data today, but let me just tell you some of the areas that are getting additional doses as hotspots. MPP for Hamilton Mountain, MPP for Hamilton West and Ancaster Dundas. I'm only reading out NDP MPPs here just for the public. Uh, MPP for Niagara Falls, MPP for Ottawa South, sorry, that's a Liberal, MPP for uh, Brampton East, MPP for Brampton North, MPP for Brampton Centre, MPP for Guelph, Order. that's a Green member, MPP for Windsor West, MPP for Windsor Tecumseh. MPP for Essex, Opposition MPP to order. for Scarborough Guildwood, MPP for Scarborough Southwest, MPP for York Center, MPP for Don Valley East, MPP for Include Don Valley answer. West, MPP for Humber uh, River, Black Creek, MPP for York South. Thank you. Thank you very much. Question period's over.